Well, greetings, my sisters, and welcome to This Is My Story, where we share stories of women's journey through life and her perspective, a panel discussion on various topics. And we're so glad to see everyone tonight. Hope you had a wonderful weekend. And we continue the theme for this month, Stand Up, Speak Out, Advocates for a Cause. And tonight, our guest is Taylor Lopez residential program manager with Agape Nashville Domestic Violence Division, and she will share information about their organization and cause. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, you're an awesome God, your wonderful Savior. We thank you, Lord, for just being who you are in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that we have access to you and that we can make our petitions known before you. So we lift up everyone tonight on this line, even those that will watch the replay, we pray for them as well. Father, we thank you for our, our presenter tonight. Uh, uh, Ms. Lopez, thank you, Lord, for her life and what she does in the community to help women to be uh, to be restored, Father, uh, and to, to be healed We and for a place of safety. We uh, pray for those that's on the line that's uh, currently going through domestic violence situations, and we pray that this segment will help them to make a decision to, uh, to have a, an escape plan or to be healed from even the trauma of domestic violence. Balance. And so, Father, we ask that you touch those that are, that are on here that's not feeling well in their body, those that are sick, God, those that are in the hospital, those that are in rehab. And Father, we know that you know everyone by name, and we just speak healing over them and for restoration in Jesus' name. So we thank you, Lord, for who you are and all you're going to do in and through our lives. And we just give you all the praise and we give you the glory for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we'll read our scripture. Scripture is Luke, the fourth chapter, verse 18. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. And I've read Luke, the fourth chapter, 18th verse, and that is the King James Version. And we're going to have our musical video by Kiara Sheard Keller and Karen Clark Sheard. Something has to break. We know that in our lives, we know that there are a lot of issues that people go through, but we know that God is able to cause you to be delivered and healed from those. And that's why we're doing this song, Something Has to Break. something has to break i tell you what every time i hear that song it just something breaks up for me oh whatever issues whatever situations it is it, it it's got to break and it all breaks how in the name of jesus there is power in the name of jesus i'm so thankful tonight for our segment uh this, this segment speaks home to me because I am a former victim of domestic violence. And uh, when they was talking about something has to break and, and how God is standing there for you, because uh, I remember uh, with, with my first husband, I was in that situation and he was into drugs and alcohol and he uh, started, uh, I guess, wasn't a, wasn't a good month into our marriage. Uh, he had starting started to uh to violate me and, and hit me and beat me and uh and it was one day uh the lord had led me to fast and i fasted and prayed that day and uh he came home he was all high and accused me of this and that didn't know where he was saying that i changed the whole house around and everything was still the same and uh he walked in the restroom where i was i was in i think i was combing my hair or something and um he walked in and he said, he looked at me and just really looked at me really mean, more mean than what he normally had. And uh, and he looked at me, he said, I ought to just kill you. I ought to just kill you. But honey, it's something about fasting and praying. 
something about fasting and praying. I stood up to him and I said, in the name of Jesus, I said, for God, I live and for God, I die. I said, you take me out. I'm still going to going to live or something. I said, it's been so long. And uh, he backed up and then he started towards me again. And I, and I said, in the name of Jesus, and he backed up again. And he started towards me again. I stood him, I stood up. He was like six foot tall. I'm five three. So I stood straight, straight up to him in his face. In the name of Jesus. I had power and a thought. And plus, I done been got sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm like, no, not today. No, you're not gonna do this today. Not to me. And honey, when I said that last one, he backed up and he just kind of looked at me, just kind of mouths down and that's all right. I'll be back. And I just looked at him. I said, in the name of Jesus. And he left on out. Well, uh, eventually the Lord uh, relieved me from that situation because he ended up getting arrested about maybe a day or two later from violating someone else. And so the Lord will bring you out. But 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 uh, also there is power in the name of Jesus. And so God is so good and he's great to be praised. And I appreciate our guest tonight, uh, Miss uh, Taylor, and I'll just go ahead and read her bio. I just wanted to share a little bit of that to let you know that God can bring you out. Taylor Lopez is originally from a small town in central Illinois, and she attended Union University in Jackson, Tennessee, and obtained her bachelor's in social work. After graduation, Taylor moved to Nashville and began working at the Department of Children's Services as a foster care worker. Taylor left DCS after four years of complete uh, to complete her master's in social work internship at the Salvation Army. And in the summer of 2019, Taylor began working at Morningstar as a case manager and in 2022 transitioned into the residential program manager and while working at Morningstar, Taylor has also been a foster parent to over 35 children and recently married her best friend, Henry. And so at this time, I do want to uh, present uh, Sister Taylor and, uh, Lopez as she shares, and we will come back in after she shares for a dialogue. At this time, receive Taylor Lopez. Thank you so much for having me on and thinking about us. Um, hard, we all know that domestic violence is affecting multiple people and probably somebody, we all know somebody who's been affected by it. And so being able to speak about it um, is truly a pleasure Pleasure, um, and to let people know that there are people here to help um, when in need um, is really exciting. I just wanted to share quickly um, a verse that I had recently shared with um, our staff at Morningstar, we have advocates that are there 24-7, 365. They work 12-hour shifts. It's much like a nurse's schedule, um, but they're long and hard days. And so um, this is Psalms 59, 16. But I will sing of your strength. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning. For you have been to me a fortress and a refuge in the day of my distress. Psalm 59, 16. Mm -hmm. um, and I just felt led to share that with my staff as um, the days are long, the days are hard, um, but we're there for a purpose and for us to continue to focus while we're there. Um, so Agape um, took over Morningstar in 2018. Morningstar was first created through Madison Church of Christ, um, and it was Years ago, it was a children's home, and then it trans. Um, it became the domestic violence shelter, and so they came in 2018 and asked Agape if they would be willing to take over. It was getting to a point where um, they were unable to continue to manage it, and knew that if it would, if they let it go, it'd be a huge loss to the community. And so um, they overtook that in 2018. But Agape has a rich history that goes all the way back to 1966. Um, Agape is known, and I have it written down because I always forget something. Um, they do counseling, foster care, which includes adoptions um, and maternity care for mothers who are choosing um, to have their child be adopted. Um, 
And they also have the our domestic violence shelter, which in part of that is we have a court program that is located at the Family Safety Center. Um, this makes it able for anybody to come and get an order protection 24-7, 365, um, making us the only place in the country that is you're where you're able to do that. So we are a pioneer um, in a lot of ways on domestic violence here. Um, and one of those ways is being able, letting um, women and men be able to come somewhere in the night and be able to immediately seek some type of protection. Um, we also have a mentorship program that ladies who complete our domestic violence program are able to join. Um, and that is just some ladies wrapping around um, them and just helping them walk through the next stages of life as they continue um, to try to take steps of healing. Um, and so they help with whatever way that looks like. And then just recently, um, actually, we just had an open house yesterday um, for something called Maria's House. And it is for teen mothers in foster care. Um, and this is helping those teenage moms um, learn how to be moms um, with the help of a, a woman who's going to be um, shepherding them and helping them teach the basic skills of what it looks like to be a mother and help champion them um, through that. You know, they're not only in foster care, but they have to have a child. So it's very difficult. Um, and so that's just open in Clarksville. And so um, I'm sure there'll be a, a young teenager and and child on their way very soon because there's an abundance of those in foster care. Mm. Um, and in 2022, um, we had over 11,000 counseling sessions. Um, Agape has created, are using church facilities in rural areas to be able to help facilitate and get um, these uh to allow counseling be available to people in rural communities where they, so they don't have to travel to the bigger city or wherever it's right there. It's accessible. And it's also a sliding scale basis. Mm -hmm. um, so if you don't have insurance, there is a small fee, but it's um, really manageable to pay. Um, mm -hmm. We had 71 foster homes, 10 adoptions, 110 children in foster care, 200 victims sheltered at the shelter and 964 order of protections completed through Agape. Um, and just this last month in our shelter, we had 34 people in shelter at 17 women, um, 14 children and three men. Um, one of our, so we do, we're a 60 day emergency shelter to both single women and moms, children and men, but we do house men in hotels um, just for safety purposes. Everything we do is around the health and safety of the ladies um, and men that we serve. And so we do not have men come to our campus, but we do serve them on um, at the hotel. Um, we have, we're made up of two homes. Um, so it's a very unique setting. We, um, which comes with a great experience, especially for children. Some children don't know that they're in a shelter. They think they're just staying at somebody else's house, mm -hmm. um, which is great, um, a little less trauma. And so we'll take that. Um, but it also makes them very comfortable um, in shelter. But it also comes with, you know, community living and having to share the kitchen and everybody's clean standards are different. And um, so that always comes with challenges. Um, but we are able to manage those pretty well. Um, during their shelter stay, they are able to meet with a case manager. Um, this case management will help with um, really anything that they choose to work on. And so because we are trying to give them um, the ability to know that they can make choices and they are able to set boundaries, we do not force them to do anything other than we have four main expectations and that's all around health and safety. No, no violence, no weapons on campus, no drugs on campus, and don't show, share where you are, mm -hmm. um, especially with your abuser. Um, and so those are our own main rules and that's all for health and safety. And so we do ask um, 
if they would like to, to meet with case management and to work on goals. Most people do wanna work on goals because they wanna get housing of their own. As um, if you are in Davidson County, you will know that housing is not cheap or easy to come by, especially for people who have low income or multiple barriers um, like evictions or maybe they've not been able to work because maybe that was part of their abuse as they weren't able to be um, go out into the community, their abuser made them quit their job. Um, so it, it becomes very, very difficult. Um, and so, and then 60 days, it's, it's very difficult to get housing. We, um, though, work with a few different agencies in the community. Um, there's something called the continuum of care. And so a different domestic violence, um, us and the YWCA are the only two emergency shelters in Nashville, but we work with um, shelters that work with primarily homelessness, and um, they have different types of funding to help um, people get into housing as quick as possible. Um, it's called, um, thankfully, that is something that our ladies are able to participate in um, and to be able to help them only like not only meet their immediate goals but their future goals as well um a lot of what we're doing in the first um and it just depends on the person um few days is just meeting the basic needs making sure they're being fed making sure they have some clean clothes to put on um making sure they have appropriate hair products a lot um depending on some people are, have planned to leave for quite some times and have a bag packed and their essential documents and others. Um, an incident happened and they didn't know they're leaving and then all of a sudden they were there and so they've come with nothing. And so we do make sure that they have their basic needs met. Um, we also want to help children make it feel seamless where they're able to continue at their same school if possible, um, if it's safe. If it's not safe, say, dad knows you're gonna, what car you drive, you're gonna drop your kid off at this time. Maybe it's not the safest for your kid to continue to go to the same school. Um, and so we just walk through that with the moms and just help them make the choice. Um, it's up to them what they wanna do, but we will help them. Um, and if so, we can move their schools. Um, but we do really try to make it things seamless for the kids. We do a lot of fun activities. Um, we call them family enrichment activities where, um, you know, our goal is to help break um, the, the cycle. We want to be cycle breakers. We want to be help them break cycles um, because we know that children who have witnessed us um, I don't know if you guys have heard of ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. The, the kids are smart. They see things, they hear things, um, and that affects them. Um, and it may not affect them today, but it could affect them in a couple of years. And you're like, where did that come from? Well, oh yeah, he heard dad say that to me. His dad say that to me. So he thinks he can talk to me like that. Mm -hmm. um, so we just are really trying to coach parents on things to look out to and things like that. Um, our ladies are also able to, we have a therapist on site. And so they're able to meet with her free of charge. Um, and so that's really beneficial. She's able to meet immediate needs, some crisis intervention, um, because people go through some really dark days um, when they come to shelter. Um, it takes an average person seven to nine times to leave, to leave for good. So, you know, as they leave, they're contemplating, am I making the right decision? But that's my baby's dad. I want, I want her to have a father. And so they're, they're, playing out all these different scenarios in their head. They're having all these conversations. And so we're help, we're there to help them navigate those. Um, pull, get, help them not be ashamed of what they've gone through because a lot of it is so shameful for them um, and just love and support. Um, so that our, having a therapist on site is really beneficial. We also have a wellness advocate who helps the person um, just look at their self as a whole, physically, emotionally, spiritually. What does it look like when you're emotionally well? What's it look like when you're emotionally unwell? And how can we keep you from going all the way to emotionally unwell? How can we keep you where you can 
realize, hey, I think I'm being triggered or I'm going to a bad place. What are some things I can do to get me back to a good place? Um, and then our in our other case manager works a lot on resume building, um, interview skills, um, really anything that they can come up with, we'll work with them on it. Um, and if we don't know things, we have a lot of community partners that we're, we can reach out to and we're like, hey, I don't know anything about this, but I hear you do. Tell me what you know and how we can get um, connected. And so we also have like outside agencies like Nurture the Next who come in and do parenting classes. And so each mom is able to go through that and they get a certificate and a $50 gift card when they complete it. And so there's a little bit of incentive, but also teaching just some good skills because um, you know, they've experienced trauma, the child's experienced trauma, they're tired. Um, and so we know it's hard to parent when we're tired. So um, being able just to help and support them as much as possible. We also have things like support group on Tuesday nights. It is in the community. It's at Madison Church of Christ that anybody's welcome to go to. Um, but a lot of time our ladies will join them. Um, um, we have house meetings where we discuss different things like, um, like let's clean up after ourselves. You know, don't leave raw chicken out for this long. It's not safe, you know, um, for it to be out there for days at a time. You know, that's just wasteful. And so helping them even some like with independent living skills. Um, sometimes we, I, as I take for granted the things that I've been taught and not everybody's been taught. And we'll have the total opposite as well as um, some people would come in and, you know, if they, their house wasn't cleaned, spotless, smelling like bleach when their abuser got home, that was part of their abuse. And so helping those people step back and say, you know what, I don't have to clean this. Like, it's good to be clean, but I don't have to have it spick and span clean um, and it's uh, gonna be okay. And I, um, and helping them kind of walk through that. Um, do we, let's see what else. Um, some other th things that we do is we have um, an instructor come in and teach trauma-informed yoga, um, which is always really fun for the ladies and the children will do it too. Um, we also do, um, we have one of our advocates, she um, does photography on the side and so she'll come in and take family portraits and we'll get those printed out for them and things. So that's a really sweet time. Um, it's always fun to watch them. And then I know um, it seems crazy, but the holidays will be coming up very soon. And so we make sure that holidays at the shelter are very um, as normal as possible. Um, we try to spoil them. Um, at Thanksgiving and Christmas, we we have big meals and we do Christmas big, um, and so not not just gifts, um, but just throughout the month, fun activities um, where parents are able to bond with their kids, love on their kids, um, and the single women love it too. I'm um, because it, it's always fun to act like a kid, <laughs> um, even around Christmas time, and it's just it's a great time, but it also it can be a really difficult time for families, um, whether they've had to move um, across the country to come here to try to get away. Uh, we do serve people from anywhere. All they have to do is call our hotline um, and an advocate answers and we'll do a quick assessment over the phone to make sure that they do qualify for our shelter. We are grant funded. We're partially grant funded. So we have some grants, but we also are um, privately funded. And so through donations. And so there are some like um, requirements that we have to, um, that each person has to meet um, because we're, it's through the Office of Criminal Justice Program, OCJP is what they call it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they, um, so there are a few things, but they call, we'll do this quick assessment. Um, and if they don't fit our, our shelter, we know other shelters and so we can see what other shelters, we're always trying to give out resources. Maybe they're in West Tennessee and so we can say, okay, where exactly are you at in West Tennessee? Maybe they're in Jackson and Jackson has a, a RAP um, program and um, that 
works with women of domestic violence and sexual assault. And so we know that we can give out their information. They give out our information. Um, and I think Catherine's going to share one of um, the hotlines, the domestic violence. It's There's a national wide and then there's a statewide um, one, but specifically for our um, our Morning Star Sanctuaries crisis line, our number is 615-860-0003. And I can type in the chat real quick too. Um, and so feel free to share it. We have people call who maybe are just experiencing homelessness and we'll be glad to help direct them in the right path. We have, um, we'll have moms call us and say, hey, my my daughter told me this and something doesn't feel right and I know my daughter and um so we can help that person just kind of walk through maybe some questions they can ask and how they can support their child or their friend um and so we we use it as a crisis line it's not just to enter into shelter but whatever we can help with um we're glad to help with we want to be helpful we want to um, serve people well. Um, one thing that is different about us is we are under agape, and so we are Christ-centered, and um, because of our grants, there's some certain tape, um, of course, that we have to follow um, in, but we do have, like, a, a woman who comes out on Wednesday nights and does a Bible study. Um, we can't lead a Bible study, but as a volunteer, somebody can come out and do it. And so um, we make sure that Jesus is known and shared in our shelter. Um, and we also always have participants, which is what we call them. Um, they just are, you're different. You guys are different. And that and that's what we feel like we're called to be is different. The YWCA is great. Nashville could not handle domestic violence without them. They're so important. But we, we're made to be different at Morningstar because we have the love of Jesus Christ in the way we treat people. Um, we want that to be reflected in what we do. Um, I don't think, I think I covered everything. It's a lot, every day is different. Um, but I think um, if anybody has any like specific questions. Okay. Let me bring you back on. We really have um, been blessed by the information that you've been sharing. It's really a lot to unpack, and, and especially in just thinking about domestic violence. Um, I do, uh, you know, like you were saying, that I never thought about it being a place for men of domestic violence. You always think it being more of, of women. And so when you said, uh, then there are men that, of course, that are victims of domestic violence, but they're placed in the hotels, like a whole different place, mm -hmm. possibly because it could trigger the women to be around men. So I do understand that. But it it really was an eye opener just to think about men that are victims, and which I'm sure they are, but you really mainly hear about the women being right. victims. Yeah, men... Um... A lot of times, just the stigma of men is they don't want to call for help, um, and that's understandable because it's it is people feel so much shame with that, and so mm -hmm. they they are like, you know, I'm a man, I shouldn't, you know, I shouldn't be experiencing this. I don't need help. Mm -hmm. um, but those the men that do reach out, they're they're very thankful. Um, we're able to just kind of help and guide them, which sometimes, um, I mean, being a social worker, when I, you know, just graduated college, moving to a new city where I'm from the middle of nowhere, I mean, it was overwhelming, the different resources or who to call or where to go. And so um, just having somebody who that's their job to know <laughs> um, is really helpful to be able to point you. And so um, we are able to love on the men um, we try to do it well. Um, they make it a little more difficult, um, cause they don't want to accept too much help. Um, but they usually though are also, you know, they may have a job and, or a vehicle. And so, um, which is much easier is, or if they're not taking care of children, um, which is a blessing, but also very difficult. Um, I don't, if anybody's familiar, 
to get a daycare voucher, you have to have a job. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. But to have a job, you need daycare. So mm-hmm. you're in this cat in this middle ground, like, okay, I want to work, but I need daycare. But I need daycare to get a job. It, it's it's we are working within broken systems in a broken world. Um, and it beca- it's very difficult and can be really disheartening. Um, and a lot of the people do struggle with it. Mm-hmm. Um, but we just try to get unique and go work around things as much as possible. But it, it but it, there are difficult things like that. Um, especially for moms that it's like, mm-hmm. I, I don't, I want to work, but I can't, I yeah. don't know what to do. I have nobody to help um, watch the kids so I can get started. So um, we help them navigate that um, as best as we can. So if, as far as the men, so there are men that are, that are uh, ministering or counseling the men that are victims, right? Yeah. So um, we, the men counselors and there is a lot of times they don't end up um, taking it. Um, advantage of the counseling, um, but they will work with our case management team on getting those at least basic needs met. Maybe it is food boxes and um, temporary shelter. There are some different male specific programs in the city. Um, one of them, the Salvation Army, uh, Matthew 25, mm-hmm. that are both like programs that will help work and get them a place of their own. Okay. Sounds good. It's a lot of good information. Uh, And then I just have one more. I'm going to open it up for dialogue. In reference to uh, the police protection, say, for instance, uh, uh, one that is a victim, they um, may have just had to leave with just the clothes on their back, but they uh, do, uh, they are part of a, uh, um, the mortgage or on the deed. Um, you know, where they're part of a lot of different things are part of a banking account, you know, as far as marriage and different things like that. Uh, how do they go about obtaining uh, the rights to their to their items, um, you know, without it being really a, just kind of speak. When to people them. come, especially a marriage, and this could be a marriage of 20 years or so, um, not a new, new relationship, um, your, your life is meshed together. Um, mm-hmm. And so pulling one by one you apart um, is difficult, but we do try to help walk through each step. And so um, sometimes we can have a police escort to go get their basic things if they would like. Some people will say, I, you know, if he destroys it, I'll call it a loss. It is what it is. Um, material things, not worth it. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's it's all up to them it's their choice and um but we would have them go with the police escort if they did decide to go because um when somebody is leaving or has right after they have left it is the um most lethal time um you have taken control away from that abuser Mm -hmm. and he's not happy and he will do what he needs he feels he needs to do Mm -hmm. um to get that control back which can is often will end um a person's life and that time and so we do never recommend them to go back without um police escort um for their safety but there are things like and um, before they even come to shelter is do you have a tracker on your phone like a find my friends like I can see where my husband is. He can see where I am. And in a normal, healthy relationship, that's fine. But when that's a control thing, so before they even come to shelter, we'll say, can you look through your phone and make sure everything is turned off one by one? Make sure that Facebook, Instagram, whatever you're using, you are not tagged, like tied to him. Changing passwords to email addresses or getting a full e- new email address, mm-hmm. um, bank accounts, which is difficult. Whenever the more you get into it, it's like, okay, whose money is this? Whose money is that? Um, but we always do recommend that they reach out to Legal Aid Society, um, where they can help them free of charge. Um, the unfortunate part of Legal Aid is, it is a there's typically some type of wait list, 
Um, but to, with domestic violence, it is a little bit sped along um, for some assistance and trying to get things. And they can help then with a divorce. Um, and then that would be like a mortgage or a deed on a home or cars, um, because we'll have we'll have a lady who has a car with their abuser's name on it, which he's probably done on purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and then they'll be out and get arrested because the car has been reported stolen. And he knows it's not been stolen, mm -hmm. but he knows I, I can get her arrested. Mm -hmm. um, and we've had people from out of state get somebody arrested here um, when they were just out and about. And, uh, um, and so, you know, thankfully she was, let go um, quickly. She had police reports from the other, um, the state she came from. And so she was able, they were like, okay, we understand. We still have to take the vehicle because your name is not on it. And she was like, that's fine. Um, but, you know, there's so much that can keep you, keep you together um, when you're trying to break free. That's amazing. <laughs> um, a lot of good there's activity. also, um, it's not a, it's not a Gape or Morning Star, but um, people here in Davidson County that go to court for an order of protection or any type of um, domestic violence dispute, mm -hmm. um, we have something called the Gene Crow Advocacy Center, and that's where a victim witness can go with you to court. Mm -hmm. um, it's also an area where you can sit, so you're not sitting in the same hallway as your abuser and maybe his whole family. Um, you may not even have to go in and see the judge if not necessary. So you never have to see your abuser the whole time you're there. Typically, we just suggest they go a little bit early. They go into this area. They can sit. There's mm -hmm. snacks. It's um, trauma-informed. Um, and just sit there and try to have as much uh, like peaceful, relaxing time much as possible as you can be in a courthouse. Mm -hmm. And then um, if needed, to go into the courtroom, then you would have a, a, a advocate right along with you telling you, hey, this is what we're going to do. This is what the judge is going to say. You know, he'll ask you to state your name and your, you know, X, Y, Z, mm -hmm. and then we'll sit down and then we can come back to the room and then they can either wait for them, wait and make sure the abuser and his family has left uh -huh. or walk them out to their car just to make sure something doesn't happen in the meantime, because we do know that some people do not care where they are, they will do um, mm -hmm. whatever they feel is necessary. Hmm. That's amazing. And that's a good thing to know because going to court, you're thinking that you're gonna see uh, the abuser. And then so doing it that way, makes it so much more easier. And then you don't have as much anxiety, you know, um, when you're going and thinking, I'm going to see them again, because something about seeing them can trigger, you know, a lot of different emotions and fear and anxiety it takes you right back to some of those moments of abuse, you know. Absolutely. So a lot of times they would choose not to go mm -hmm. um, just because of that. And so sometimes being able to sh just share mm -hmm. um, this, they're like, okay, well, maybe I can do this and get an order of protection. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. I'm going to open the floor for a dialogue. Anyone have any questions or comments? I think uh, Dr. Crick had one. I think she answered that and she put the number in the chat. Any other questions or comments? Any other questions or comments? I would, I would say if you, if any of you ever have a question or um, please reach out or you're even if it's somebody experiencing homelessness and you run across please have them call us uh, we want to help people we want to serve people even if we can't bring them into our shelter we are a small shelter um, we want to help people and so if you ever have any questions or run anything please feel free to reach out either to our hotline or to myself um, we can share my um, email address um, and I'd be glad to help whatever way I can. Okay. So any other questions or comments? Okay, I have some questions though, uh, in reference to what I got from line. It's like, uh, and, and these are like, 
common questions in reference to what how do you what how do you identify uh, these particular type of abuse um, gaslighting because I know we hear gaslighting a lot could you explain gaslighting yeah um, so gaslighting I think um, has become more and more popular the term and sometimes maybe used incorrectly mm -hmm. um, but the gaslighting can be like um, I seen you do that and you're like I didn't do anything and you're like no I seen you do that and try to convince you that you have done something or said something that you never said it or did in the first place. And so then you are like, have I lost it? Mm -hmm. Am I like, am I losing it? Um, and they will use that to their way to manipulate you. Um, and you said I could go out with my friends. I didn't wait. What? <laughs> you know, just, uh, or, you didn't tell me that you were doing this. I, I did tell you, no, you didn't. You Just where it becomes manipulation, arguments that just escalate. And so, um, you know, a lot of times when abuse happens, it's not, you know, it's not a first date. I'm going on a date and I'm like controlling you, gaslighting you on my first date. That's, that's not the case. It's a progression over time. It's um, love bombing. Um, one thing you like I've heard often is like, um, you know, maybe you get daisies left on your car because and you're and everybody's like, oh, how sweet daisies on your car. But what you what they don't know and you do know is that he said the day there's daisies on your car will be your last day on Earth. Mm. And so he you know, people are thinking oh this is so sweet so kind and it can seem like a great gesture to everybody else but he has told you in the past when you see these it's over mm -hmm. um and so there are threats that are made um that come across they know how to play the game uh some of the most intelligent people are i feel like abusers the way they are able to break into somebody's emails and um the, the way they think to track somebody like um an insurance card so i i know a man who he was getting out of prison for abuse he called the insurance card well i'm her husband what's the address associated with this well they shouldn't have shared it mm -hmm. but they shared it and so he was able to track him down and track her down and so when i'm released from prison i know where you are now and I'm coming for you because what I didn't finish the first time, I will finish now. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, she had to flee where she thought she, this man had been in prison for years uh, for attempted murder against her. But now is, OK, he's up. He's ready to get out. And here he, he's coming back. He He's not done. Um, and so that control. um the, the way they think to, I mean, I would have never thought to call the ins my insurance company to be like, and what's the address on you have on here? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I mean, it blows my mind. That is something to think about. I never thought about that either, but uh, I guess they use all type of tactics and especially if they're in prison. All they have time to do is just to think. So they yeah. keep a lot of creative ideas and plans that when they get out, what they're going to do. Yep. That's amazing. So what is, uh, did anybody have any questions about that, about gaslighting? Okay. And of course we know cyber stalking since we're real, dealing with uh, social media, cyber stalking. Yeah, and we, we do see a lot of that or where they'll take control of maybe their like Facebook page um, and we'll post degrading things. Um, I, you know, I left my husband, I hate him. Or maybe they've shared inappropriate pictures and posting those on Facebook mm -hmm. for, you know, all of her friends and family to see. Um, but it is a way that they do find them um, also just like, you can, I, I, I don't even know if maybe they went got away with this or like, um, 
are no longer doing it like on Facebook, but mm -hmm. you could like post something and it could say like that you're in East Nashville or you're on like so-and-so street where you took this picture. Mm -hmm. Well, for safe people, that's fine. But, but for somebody who's experiencing domestic violence, that's very unsafe. And so um, those are things that, you know, we, we try to walk through with them is like, okay, I, that I know this is annoying <laughs> and it can take some time depending on how many apps they have. That includes kids. Mm -hmm. Kids too is, um, if they have kids that are old enough to have phones, it's like, we got to be really careful and we try to have really age appropriate conversations with them of like, um, why they're there, mm -hmm. um, which they typically know, but, you know, not saying dad called me and it was like, just, just tell me where you are. Just tell me where you are. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's your dad. You feel like, like you should be able to tell him where you are. Mm -hmm. Um, and so just making sure they try to keep that. And, um, we always just tell the kids, say you're in a safe place. Um, you know, nobody needs to know where you are. Mm -hmm. You know, you're coming to school on a different bus than normal. I'm mm -hmm. staying in a safe place. Um, and if anybody has any questions, just tell them they're being nosy. <laughs> I heard that. I heard that. And then let's see, of course, we know that uh, people think about uh, physical abuse, but there is verbal abuse as well. Um, but then uh, let's see. What is tra say, trauma bonding? Trauma yeah. bonding. Um, trauma bonding is whenever multiple, when you've both experienced some type of trauma. And so you kind of bond over that. So you're like, you're like, I experienced X, Y, Z and you experienced X, Y, Z and A, B, C, but we have that in common. And so they will bond together and like, and it can either, it can be a negative thing and it can be a positive thing. I we, mm -hmm. At shelter, we'll see it both ways because women are coming there seeking refuge from horrible domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes there will be bonding or, um, or, if, or even becoming dependent on somebody who's maybe a stronger person, stronger personality, mm -hmm. where they just kind of, latch on to them mm -hmm. and want to be carried around with them but when mama already has herself and her kids to worry about it's really difficult for her to be able to take care of another adult yes. as well and so um we do see some trauma bonding um we do um things like that we'll speak into um even if it's like the strong personality has somebody kind of attached to them um, we want them to know it's okay to say, hey, I need some room mm -hmm. because we want them to focus on themselves. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of happens like if somebody comes to shelter and they have a vehicle because not, not everybody has vehicles. Right. The bus system is great, but it takes some work. And with these hot days mm -hmm. today, these couple of days coming up, nobody wants to stand out at the bus stop. And so... Um, but being able to set boundaries and say, you know what, I would love to be able to, but I can't. Mm -hmm. Or just the plain no. no. A no is a complete sentence. Mm -hmm. And we do tell them that is like, use your voice. There's a way to use your voice where it can be heard loud and strong and can be respectful. Mm -hmm. And so um, we do encourage people to use their voice and, um, you know, speak um, where they've been not allowed to hmm. they've been quiet been they've had to be quiet for so long and um, we want them to practice that too is like it may not go well you may say set a limit with your roommate and say hey i i need this for myself and for my healing mm -hmm. and that person may go up in arms well that's okay. But you like, look, that was great practice and we can help kind of mediate the situation, but what a great place to practice. And when there is somebody there to help and help you navigate and like, look at what a great job you did and you used your voice. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of encouragement um, is what we try to give them. Yeah. That's good. That's good. I had just looked some of these things up and was wondering 
especially about some of the um, some of the words here, the types of abuse. It's kind of like what I was kind of wondering, you know, just and I was looking at that on the website. It gives a lot of yeah. information. There's so many different types of abuse that you can go through. Um, right. And so right. physical abuse, of course, because it's physical, you may be able to see marks or something. Mm -hmm. um, but we really try to not have um, the ladies downplay emotional abuse, mm -hmm. uh, spiritual abuse, financial abuse. Mm -hmm. Those, it doesn't matter. It's abuse, it's power and control. Um, so it doesn't matter to us. Mm -hmm. You deserve to be at our shelter just like anybody else. Cause sometimes we'll be like, well, it, it wasn't that bad. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that bad. I wasn't strangled. Mm. I wasn't, you know, he didn't hold, hold a gun to my head. Well, maybe not that time, but that doesn't mean he wouldn't escalate to that. And so mm. we really don't want them to downplay that. We want them to see the value in themselves, mm -hmm. the value in their children, mm -hmm. um, to be able to feel value and worth. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. You're right. Cause sometimes they could just say, well, it wasn't that bad or, you know, and, uh, but then at the same time they go, well, I go back. I'm, it wasn't, he, he really didn't mean it to start making excuses because mm -hmm. it's hard for them to make a decision to leave uh, as well as I uh, remember you saying something about the shame, the guilt. Well, look at the children. I'm taking them away from their dad or, you know, it's things like it, whereas a woman would feel guilty about something. So um, she she tries to endure some of the abuse, which realistically, she's just putting them in more in harm's way because yeah. it, it escalates in another, wasn't as bad this time, but the next time yeah. it's going to be, you know, worse or he's going to hit you somewhere else or, uh, or he, he may start to burn you or he may start to kick you. I mean, just different escalations of abuse because it may start off with just raising their voice or uh, even putting their fist through the, the the door but they really mean to hit you but they're putting their fist through the door next time it's going to be you that they're going to hit right. and uh, and then who's to say that that once they have abused you when is it going to start for the kids they it, it it can turn just like that it could turn you know like i said in reference to children a child, yeah, with child just trying to help mom can immediately, you know, get right in the middle of that. And mm -hmm. um, then it becomes a different problem. Mm -hmm. I can remember my grandfather, uh, when my grandmother was going through that with my grandfather, uh, and he started to be more and more angry as he was very controlling. And she, 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 de she decided that yeah, she wanted to learn how to drive. And so she could be a little bit more independent because she's very independent. She worked and everything, but he said, no, you don't need to know. Why do you need to know how to drive? Why do you need a car? I've got a car. I can pick you up. Right? She can go on the bus, you know, well, I want to, uh, I just want my own car. Cause she lived in, in um, she was originally from maybe 40 miles outside of Louisville. So she wanted to go visit her parents more and things like that. And he said, well, I'll take you. And sometimes he won't take it. Sometimes he, he wouldn't. Well, it got to the point where, she went ahead and she took up driver's lessons. I think during that time, I don't forget who it was, but they, it was like the, the state driver's license, driver's test. And so she, she did that and they took her to get her license, passed the test, took her to get her license and everything. And she saved her money from her job little by little and bought her a car. I never forget the day that she drove her car uh, home and parked it in front of the house. And he's, whose car is that? That's my car. Oh, he went off. But that, then again, at that time, just verbal abuse. But little by little, she was, um, you know, kind of, uh, he. in other words, he was losing control because she wasn't allowing him to manipulate her and control her. And uh, so she could be independent. Then, uh, of course, then she got another job and started working at GE. She was able to drive there, but she was making more money. And little by little, she was saving her money. And uh, he was becoming even more verbally abusive, accusing her of different things. Uh, if she wasn't home by a certain time, he was accusing her of seeing somebody else, just all these crazy things until 
one day, uh, I think it was one, it was always on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Some of y'all heard that story. <laughs> it was on a Sunday, I was on a Sunday morning and he was a deacon. And uh, for some reason, he would start in on her, just hollering at her. And then he would just hit her, you know, just hit her. And uh, then he had the nerve to call the pastor. <laughs> and she made me hit her. <laughs> she made her, she made me hit her. And so the pastor would come down, talk to him, and then they would all go to church. But she still went to church. And uh, then it got to the point where another time he hit her, he blacked her eye. When she put her sunglasses on, went on to church, you know. But it was one Sunday, she got tired. She just got sick and tired. And he reached to hit her. She blocked it. And then she blacked his eye. <laughs> and it just chose to prove how cowardly they are. When you really come back, I'm just like I was talking about my, my ex-husband, my first husband. When I stood up to him, he's like, but it was the name of Jesus. I'm not saying it was, me, it was the name of Jesus that came against him. But that's what she did. She she blacked his eye. And he's like, oh, my eye. And he ran down the steps and he, <laughs> and he called the pastor. He and she he came down there again. And he just he said, well, you provoked her for everything that she's done to you today. You have provoked her all these many years and then I started having dreams uh about him chasing us through the house with knives I had it for about two or three weeks and I told my uh my grandmother about it she said I think it's time for us to go and true enough so we I think she made a plan and we left and went to my mother so my grandmother raised me but my mother was still living at that time so made a plan and hopped in the car she uh because my grandfather worked during the daytime she took off of work we packed our clothes and whatever we could. That's why I was asking that question. Whatever we could, and we went to my mother's house. Now he came looking for her, but he dare not come up in my mother's house because <laughs> he was going to meet Baba Jean and it wasn't going to be pretty. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm laughing now because I can look back and I'm like, wow. But uh, it, it's so true in so many ways that they little by little, like you said, they manipulate you. And and even with the gaslighting, he was accusing her. I didn't, you didn't, uh, you didn't tell me that. No, you didn't say that. I mean, just all the things that, that I was asking you, the questions of is exactly some of the things my mother, my grandmother had went through. So, but uh, she got out of that situation and, you know, did really well, you know, for herself, very independent, bought a house. Even though her name was on the deed, but some kind of way he went in and had something. I don't forget how he he worked it, but anyway. But little by little, I think after he died, her name still was on the. We found out her name was still on the deed, but by that time she really didn't care. She just wanted to be away mm -hmm. and and live her own life. But she did really well for herself after that. So. It's not the end of the world uh, being in that situation, thinking there's no way out and that you can't live without or you, you can't succeed without without them. Yes, you can. You can do that and more. So any other questions or comments before we close out? All right. Well, Taylor, you have given us a wealth of information tonight, and I know there'll be people that will watch the replay, and I really want to encourage you all on here to share this information with somebody that you know that may be going through that same situation and, and to be able to help them. There's a 1-800 number, uh, and like uh, Taylor said, you can also have them call if you're local here, call their number as well to get the help that they need. Uh, I do want to mention the uh, Her Fragments, uh, His Glory Tour. We did well in Tupelo, Mississippi. Uh, Ms. Cooper was so excited. <laughs> and she's been in meetings on Monday, so sometimes you may see her, sometimes you don't. I don't even, yeah, she's on here tonight. And uh, so we just let her talk about that just for just for a few seconds, Ms. Cooperwood, if you can unmute your line and talk about the Tupelo experience. And then after that, we're going to come back and tell you about the registration for the Nashville. And then we'll have Taylor uh, give closing remarks and close us out in prayer. Ms. Tupelo, Ms. Uh, Tupelo, Ms. Cooperwood. Good, after good afternoon to everyone. Good, good evening. 
Hey, How y'all doing? We doing great. How you doing? Doing good. Uh, uh, I'm fantastic. Fantastic. Tell us just a little bit about uh, how how you felt about uh, the Tupelo encounter. It was uh, it was very <laughs> it was very excited and um, it was something that was needed in the area because I'm telling you, people think they can't be healed and delivered. Yes, they can. They can be healed and delivered. You know, it just it just has something strange about it. It just something strange about God. And his word is true. So we just we just got to keep on keeping on. All I know is something happened in that room that Saturday. It was it, it was really great. That's I can't explain it, honey. I can't explain it, but it was joy in that room. Joy. Joy in the room. When that gospel singer said, come on in the room, come that on. old lady, it was something going on in the room. <laughs> and who meant to be there was there. It was very exciting. Very exciting. Each, each, each three of the ladies now, four of the ladies, including you, uh, three, uh, had a, they had, <laughs> I'm telling you, they had a fantastic topic God gave them to them, and they used it. Whatever God told them to speak, they did it. All I can say, it was great. Great, great, great. Very excited. Amen. And we thank you for uh, having us there. And they fixed that. I think some of you, I, I don't think I've even posted the pictures out there uh, of it, but I know some of you have watched it on Facebook Live because I went Facebook Live and we're getting a lot of reports from the sisters that were not able to be there, but they watched it Facebook Live. And uh, event, uh, Dr. Glenda Dunlap started out I uh, started out with worship and then uh, uh, Sister Nakita Neal led us in a powerful prayer. And after that prayer, because the atmosphere was just being set, you know, with every person that came up and shared. And then um, she's minister now. She got, I think, got uh, her minister's license Sunday. Minister, uh, what is her? Susan, uh, I can't ever say her last name. She goes to New Life uh, Apostolic Assembly. She shared her testimony about depression and, and things like that and how the Lord delivered her. And then um, Dr. Glenda Dunlap shared about defining the fragments, defining the issues of your, of your heart. After that, uh, Evangelist Cindy Powell came back and she was exposing the fragments and issues and the effects of the fragments in your life. And uh, then from there, uh, she, she started talking about the different types of issues. And uh, we end up having to cut the uh, the live because it was some personal things that were shared in that room, especially by these people. Uh, one sister was there. She was a prominent uh, first lady. And so she had a place where she could really share in a safe space about some issues and things she was going through. And the Lord just came in, he manifested himself in that place from, from that on until we just went on. We didn't even stop for lunch. We just kept on going and <laughs> worshiping because God was healing and delivering. There was another sister that was dealing with grief. And so we was able to minister to her. And then uh, after that, I just came forth and just was doing exhortations on my part, be made whole, which the encounter had already happened. God was already moving. And the only thing we did was just close it out with that, just saying, be made whole. And uh, and so I had like a little exercise that I, I, that I did, especially the what I'll be doing here in Nashville. We closed out in worship and praise. And then after that, we ate lunch. So in Nashville, we don't know which way it's going to go, but it's going to be uh, September the 16th here in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, probably by Wednesday, I will have the venue where it will be. Uh, and then the registration is $30. You can go ahead and uh, send in your registration now. And I'll put my uh, my uh, information 
in the chat as well as I'll keep sharing it when I send the replay. I will also share the flyer and the information about the Nashville encounter so you can go ahead and register. Seating is limited, so the sooner you register, the more you'll be guaranteed a spot. We do have a nice place, you know, that we're proposing to have it in that's going to seat at least 50 plus, but uh, it depends on which one. If it's one that only seats about 55, then you need to really go on and register now. But if one seats just a little bit more, maybe about 60, 65, uh, then we should have room for you as well. But I just want to encourage you to go ahead and register as soon as you can. And it's only $30. You can send it cash out. Or if you want to mail it to me, you can with a check or money order. Or you can uh, uh, also do it through PayPal. And I'll put all, all that information will be when I send it to you in the replay. Okay. All right. So we look forward to seeing y'all here in Nashville, Tennessee, because we got some great, great, great and exciting things for you here in Nashville. Thank you, uh, Sister Erica Ward. Glad to see you on here tonight. And we look forward to seeing you there as well. At this time, we're going to close out. But is there any questions about that? Any questions about the Nashville encounter? Okay. And please share uh, when I send you the flyer and uh, information whenever I send the replay, please share it with others. Please share it with others and they can uh, come as well. At this time, we'll have our final remarks from uh, Taylor, who has just been awesome in this presentation and information, very vital information. I know others will be blessed by it, even as they see the replay and even as we share. So we're going to close out with final remarks from Taylor and prayer at this time. Thank the Lord for you, Taylor, and all that you do. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, again, if you guys run into anybody, um, please have them reach out. Um, sometimes we just have to plant seeds, just like in the Bible, we're just planting seeds um, for health and healing. Um, and we know that we are all out here to do great work um, in all of our different walks of life. Um, so, but if you've run into anybody, please share the um share with them, or if they're in the Davidson County area for counseling, Agape, because um, it is affordable counseling. So, um, I, but I really appreciate you guys having me on. Amen. We close us out in prayer. Can you hear me? You can close us out but, in prayer. Yeah. Uh -huh. Dearly Father, I just thank you for the, today. I thank you for everyone who has joined um, this meeting and for those who will be listening to it later. I pray that um, you be with each woman in here um, and that they are able to um, maybe have a special encounter with somebody who is experiencing domestic violence and that they'll be able to share hope with them. Um, I pray that you are with the ladies that are currently on our shelter, God, I pray that you um, just cover them uh, with your love. I pray that they are able to receive peace from you. I pray that they, um, this time in their life will be a pivotal change for them. Um, and I pray that it will be so because of you. Um, your praise and glory and honor forever in Jesus name. Amen, 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 amen. I was trying to put information in the chat about uh, the PayPal. Let's see, PayPal, I can't, can't see it here. Mm. Excuse me, Tyler, are you, no, go ahead. Are you on the 211 call, um, call, emergency call system? Yes, we, yes. we are. We are um, okay. one of their um, agencies listed. Okay, great. Thank you. Hold on a second. Okay, I put the information in the chat as far as uh, registration. Uh, and I've got in there, uh, Her Fragrances Glory Tour, September 16th, registration $30. 
uh, cash out dollar sign for those that may be on the phone. Uh, cash out dollar sign K D is in doll M is in Mary O R I, and then on PayPal it's got PayPal dot me forward slash K M Ministries one. PayPal.me forward slash KM Ministries one. Mm -hmm. And that's it. So hopefully those who want to register, at least register at least by the 10th of September uh, for pre-registration. Other than that, you would just register at the door. But we really strongly encourage you to pre-register so we can have at least a good head count of those that will be coming. However, you can register at the door for the same price. Well, I look forward to seeing each and every one of y'all then, but I also look forward to seeing y'all next Monday night. But this is my story. And we have someone else on here talking about um, another area of advocacy. Um, and I'm uh, trying to confirm those right now who will be on here for next week. So look forward to seeing y'all. Thank you all for your continued support of my ministry. I really appreciate each and every one of you for always being here when you can. I know some of you work, have different, different things that you're doing, but just knowing that you're on here, just knowing that you're looking at the replay or just an encouraging words that you send my way is really appreciated. Love each, each and every one of you. God bless you all. You have a good night. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks again, Taylor.